Happy Friday, everybody, um, and welcome. I'm Neely McNulty. I'm the Associate Curator of Education here at the Hood Museum of Art at Dartmouth. And we are really so thrilled you've joined us here today for the 100th Space for Dialogue presentation. It's a big moment for us in the history of the program. So before I introduce today's speaker, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go over with you. I think you should see a pop-up poll in front of you with one question. So thank you in advance for answering that. Um, also, there's some, Zoom, there's some Zoom chat information in the chat. You should see that. The presentation should last about 45 minutes in entirety. And there's plenty of time after the speaker talks for Q&A. So as you're listening to her, if you've got questions, just pop them in the chat and that'd be great. Um, Tomorrow, you will be able to, we're gonna send you a link and a follow-up email. You're gonna be able to access this recorded program on the Hood Museum of Arts YouTube channel. So with that, I'd like to introduce Kensington Cochran, today's speaker. I had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of working with her when she was a Conroy programming intern in her 2019-2020 academic year when she was a senior here. She's one of these students for whom academic pursuits, extracurricular activities, professional aspirations and personal beliefs really served as a foundation for her exhibition. She came to us as a neuroscience major and a history minor. While she was here at Dartmouth, she researched post-traumatic stress disorder under professors David Bucci and Alareza Soltanti. Also, Kinsey worked as an EMT and for two years she ran the Dartmouth Emergency Medical Services. Right now, she's working for McKinsey in the healthcare consulting industry. And she has goals of going to, to medical school and becoming an ER physician. So welcome home, Kinsey. We are so happy to hear from you today. Thanks. Thank you so much, Neely. And, and thank you all for joining me today. Um, before I begin, I would really like to express my deepest gratitude to the Hood Museum team for their advice and support for all the hard work that went into the physical installation of the show, and most of all for their perseverance in ensuring that against all odds, I still had the opportunity to do this. Today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about where the inspiration for the show came from, briefly describe my curatorial process, frame the show by posing three questions, discuss the objects I've chosen, and then hopefully leave lots of time for questions at the end. The origin story of this exhibition really starts five years ago when I was a research intern at Grady Hospital. Grady is Atlanta's only level one trauma center and pretty much everything bad that happens in Atlanta eventually winds up in the Grady ED. From gang violence to hurricanes, sexual assault to dog attacks, copperhead bites to multi-car pileups. Yet when the bullets were removed, stabs were sutured and the venom neutralized, some patients still left the hospital permanently altered, and this was the focus of our Grady trauma project. When that body undergoes an overwhelming stressor, something that threatens death or serious injury, the stress response system goes into overdrive, pumping out epinephrine, cortisol, cytokines, and a whole host of other chemicals. Most of the time, the body, amazingly, recalibrates, returning to, baseline, to a baseline state of balance. But sometimes it does not, and the body is in a constant state of heightened stress, manifesting as flashbacks, hyperarousal, avoidance, and altered moods. This combination of symptoms is classified today as post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. In essence, our interactions with the outside world have the ability to change the chemistry of our bodies and brains, and in turn, these chemical changes alter our interactions with the outside world. Most of the, moved by the patients I interacted with at Grady and the lack of treatment options available to them, I began to research a potential pharmaceutical intervention to PTSD with Professor David Bucci, to whom the show is dedicated. And after his passing, I was fortunate enough to study the impact of the neurochemical changes of PTSD on economic decision-making under Professor Olireza Soltani. In parallel to my neuroscience research, I began my internship at The Hood and started to explore PTSD through a new lens. For while science strives to understand the cause and chemical solution to PTSD, art has borne witness again and again to trauma and its healing process, and I think the two disciplines can learn a lot from each other. 
Because both scientific definitions and artistic responses to trauma are so fluid and evolving, I wanted to create a space that was a conversation more than anything else. So with these objects, I have posed three questions to the audience. As a quick disclaimer, I don't know if these artists have or do not have PTSD, nor do I think it matters in the context of the show. The reason I have included these objects is because they provide a useful platform on which we can have a conversation about trauma and the healing process. With that in mind, these are the three questions that I have posed to the audience um, on the wall text in the gallery. The first question is, how do we define trauma? And more specifically, how do we define PTSD? PTSD is a bit unusual as a psychological disorder in that the triggering event is an element in its diagnosis, making PTSD hyper-specific to cer certain types of experiences. And some of the objects speak to other forms of trauma not included in this strict definition. As in our healthcare system, diagnoses have tangible economic implications for the support and resources allocated to patients. How we define PTSD has tangible implications for all who are impacted by it. The second question I wanted to raise is a conversation about considering PTSD as a physiological illness. I look at PTSD from a neurochemical standpoint. There is a pathology to it. There are chemical changes in the body, just like cancer or any other disease. But it, like many other mental disorders, is not often treated as an illness. In 2012, more active duty servicemen died from suicide than were killed in combat. That same year, the US military advocated for the American Psychological Association to change the name of the disorder to post-traumatic stress injury because they thought more veterans would seek treatment if the word was injury and not disorder. And so again, the framework through which we understand trauma and its physical aftermath have serious implications for patients. The final conversation or question that I wanna pose was how artists use art in different ways as a mechanism of processing trauma. I think there are a lot of different things art allows us to do, to memorialize, to reflect, to find community, to experience emotional release. And I think all the artists in the show approach this process of healing in different ways. In addition to these three questions, there are a few other ways that I narrowed down the objects in the show. When I originally met with Kathy and Amelia to brainstorm what objects would work with the theme, we came back with about 500 objects. So I had to put up a few additional parameters. First, I wanted artists that worked in the aftermath of trauma instead of the moment, as I wanted time to allow the complicated processes of memory consolidation and retrieval to be present in the work. Second, I also focused in on modern and contemporary artists because I wanted to be able to learn a lot about their lives and creative processes. And so I was constrained by the quality of data that we have from different time periods. And finally, I wanted to include a really diverse set of perspectives because I frankly don't have the authority to speak on the experiences of a lot of the populations represented in the show. And I wanted to make sure these voices were reflected. So without further ado, I will walk you through the room. I want to anchor here first, as I think these two objects set up the definition of PTSD and provide a canonical framework um, which the other objects then converse with. On the left is a drawing by Heim Gross, depicting his experience as a Jewish man living through World War II. And on the right is an etching by Otto Dix, depicting his experience serving in World War I. In the Dix, a very gruesome, medically impossible scene is depicted. One figure's head is split open with the brain exploding out, and he speaks to a figure that is only a skull. In the gross, a lot of unusual things are happening. There are hands holding serpents, monsters consuming hands, and two lovers embracing all above a scene of a town, presumably Dieppe, France. The process between these two objects, I think, is quite revealing to um, the thought processes behind them. Dix didn't draw anything while serving in World War I but 10 years afterwards, went and did the series of etchings entirely by memory. And so they're impacted by time and by the processes of memory and emotion. He titles them, however, like news headlines, perhaps because his etches were more true to the emotion experience of the war than the photographs printed by the press. 
Haim Gross made his sketches also several years after the event. And he describes reclining in an armchair, listening to music and just drawing what comes out of his mind. So in his work, there's no plan and no overarching form. It's just a really organic release of thought and memory. I read in these two objects, all of the elements that comprise the canonical definition of PTSD. The artists are veterans of war with veterans being the primary group in which PTSD has been studied and treated. In addition, I think the four diagnostic behavioral criteria of PTSD are captured by the process and product. The fact that these pieces were made after the fact illustrate a perseveration on prior events captured in vivid flashback. The aggressive line work illustrates hyperactivity the isolated activity of creation may indicate avoidance, and the dark subject matters indicate a change in mood or affect. Building off of this World War theme, um, next in the show is a print by John Walker, articulating a World War I experience. Yet, instead of being created by a veteran, the object is actually made by a veteran's son. One of the interesting things about PTSD is that close family members can actually develop PTSD just by knowing what has happened to a person that they love. I think it's pretty interesting that the human capacity for empathy is so strong that we can be physiologically altered by events that don't even happen to us. So there's a multi-generational aspect to trauma as well. In the background here is the introductory stanza for Anthem for Doomed Youth. Uh, by Wilfred Owen. The text in the background reads, what passing bells for these who die as cattle, only the monstrous anger of the guns, only the stuttering ref rifles rapid rattle can patter out their hasty orisons. No mockeries now for them, no prayers nor bells, nor any voice of mourning save the choirs, the shrill demented choirs of wailing shells and bugles calling them from their sad shires. Though his life and his family's life were greatly impacted by the war, Evans was not able to create work about World War I until after reading Owen's poetry. I think this underscores the critical nature of art in the recovery process, not only that for those who create it, but for those who experience it. The final element I wanna explore in this object is religion. Evans uses sheep, skill, sheep skulls as shown here um, in a dual reference to both the description of sheep being marched to slaughter from Owen's poem, as well as in a reference to Christian iconography um, in relationship to the sacrificial lamb. And this religious theme is iterated again in this disjointed crosses in the background. I think this object introduces a broader theme of the role of religion in the healing process for some. Following in this parent-child theme is a drawing by Kathy Colwitz called Death Seizes the Children. I wanted a female perspective on the themes of World War I and World War II, during which Colwitz lost the sons and grandsons. In this image, a caped figure, presumably death, reaches out to grab two children. One child tries to escape while another clings to death, and a third child runs away in the background of the scene. This image is one of a series of several figures interacting with death in different ways, embracing him, greeting him, fighting him, fleeing from him. And I think it's very interesting how we artistically represent abstract concepts, such as death, as human figures. I think it gives us something to emotionally engage with, whether it's to hate or to blame or to accept. I think this is one way which we process things we can't otherwise understand. Colwitz turns an emotionally and mentally complex experience, that of losing her own children, into something she can tangibly react to with this series of lithographs. Also illustrating a tangible manifestation of trauma is this object by Bernie Searle, who is a South African artist who creates work in response to the apartheid. To create these sort of bruised images, she rubs her feet in spices that were the major drivers of the spice trade throughout South Africa and presses her feet up against glass and then photographs herself. Though she repeats this process with a series of different body parts, I love that this one shows her feet because it invokes the impact of walking through the world she lives in. In the text below the image, Searle defines the term stain, circling the word foreign. I read this textual reference in conjunction with the image 
as the experience of walking daily through your own country while being treated as other, capturing the wholly unnatural sentiment of feeling foreign in your own home. I think one of the really interesting things that this object brings into the conversation is whether trauma has to be a big singular moment or whether it can be caused by smaller daily traumas in the form of microaggressions or systematic oppression. Some of the more recent data on chronic stress suggests permanent chemical changes that are not dissimilar to PTSD. And I think that this idea that societal frameworks can create physiological changes has serious societal implications. Also underscoring the socio-political implications on health and wellness is this piece by Julie Buffalohead. I could not do a show about trauma with the Hood Museum collection and not include a piece of Native American art. In my curatorial process, I was fortunate to be able to work with Jamie Powell, who is our incredible curator at Native American art. And we talked through what was the right object for the show and, and came up with this Julie Buffalohead. Buffalohead is a member of the Ponca Nation and her family is originally from what is now Nebraska. This image shows a Japanese cartoon character here holding a house and the state of Nebraska in reference to the Homestead Act, which is lauded in American textbooks as this equal opportunity movement moment in American history where the US government granted land to US citizens in a egalitarian manner where women and freed slaves and immigrants could all receive rights to land. But the subtext of this story is that the Ponca people were forcibly removed from the, this land in order for the Homestead Act to take effect. The fox, which is a trickster spirit, is an image that Buffalo Head uses to describe herself and her contemporaries who juggle the dual identity of being mixed European American and Native American. The fox is guarding a turtle who is emblematic of Turtle Island, what is in Ponca and other Native American creation myths, emblematic of homeland. The turtle holds up a cat, which is a domesticated animal, perhaps representing European settlers. And the crow is another trickster figure, again, perhaps representing those of Native American descent. What I think is really cool about Buffalo Head's work is that there are deep applications and layers that are displayed with approachable characters. So though many conversations can be had about this object, I wanna highlight two in particular. The first raises a question uh, on what traumas are hidden by the dominant narratives of history. And the second questions what the longstanding consequences are of those traumas on contemporary Americans. On this theme of trauma experienced by groups is this beautiful piece by Umbreen Butt. She is a Pakistani artist who was an artist in residence here at Dartmouth in the early 2000s. In the background of this object are layered police helmets and headscarves. A woman, modeled after butt herself, leans against a bamboo pole, weeping. This object was done by butt in response to the bombing of the Red Mosque in Pakistan, where female students were used as human shields in a conflict between Islamic fundamentalists and the Pakistani government. Once again, there's many layers to unpack here, but I think the object really speaks to the trauma experienced by bystanders and the trauma that a community can experience when they bear the knowledge that something terrible has happened to some of their own. I think that she also very courageously and beautifully articulates the display of grief that is a critical but often stigmatized part of the healing process. This final object I wanna discuss is the centerpiece of my show. Um, it's where the title of the show comes from. And I think it speaks to really all three of the conversations happening. To create this lithograph, Leslie Dill painted on her friends and family an Emily Dickinson poem, The Soul Has Bandaged Moments. She then photographed them, blurred out the defining elements of the female anatomy, and then printed this piece on mulberry paper. And finally, a woman by the name of Jennifer Luck hand-stitched the final image. Highlighting a few elements here, I think this object speaks to a critical but alternative definition of trauma, which I read as gender-based violence. I love the physiology represented here as well, uh, because I see a, a really physical manifestation of psychological injury represented. And finally, I think the process behind this object speaks to an, a unique approach to the healing process, as it converses with the work of Dickinson, as, as well as the fact that the creation process involved a really uh, collective experience drawing on friends and family. 
So I want to end with this poem by Emily Dickinson that sits on the wall besides the dill. I had the pleasure of working with Ivy Schweister, who is a fabulous English prof and Emily Dickinson expert here at Dartmouth in understanding some of the history behind this poem. There is a lot of speculation as to what this poem can be about and the theories can be broken down into three general categories. The first is the civilian experience of the civil war, including the survivor guilt felt by communities that lost so many young men. The second is the experience of being an outspoken woman in the context of a, a deeply religious constraining community. And the third proposes that this poem might be about Dickinson's love life and there are a lot of speculations on her sexuality and interpersonal relationships that might be playing in here. But I don't think you need to know really what this is about to empathize with the complex range of emotions that she articulates here. The line, the soul has bandaged moments, really seemed like the perfect title for the show, primarily because I read hope in it. There are broken moments, but moments passed, and I think that this holds so much hope for the possibility of healing. I'd like to end by actually reading the poem. The soul has bandaged moments when too appalled to stir. She feels some ghastly fright come up and stop to look at her. Salute her with long fingers, caress her freezing hair, sip goblin from the very lips, the lover hovered or unworthy that a thought so mean accost a theme so fair. The soul has moments of escape when bursting all the doors, she dances like a bomb abroad and swings upon the hours. As do the bee, delirious born, long dungeon from his rose, touch liberty, the no, no more, but noon in paradise. The soul's retaken moments when felon led along with shackles on the plumed feet and staples in the song. The horror welcomes her again. These are not braid of tongue. So thank you all so much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Kensington. Here's the first question for you that was sent in. What are the implications of this work in the context of the pandemic to patients, providers, and the general population? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I think um, when we talk about PTSD in the context of, um, events that are outside the norm of the human experience. I think the last year fits into that definition for um, pretty much everyone. Um, there have been a lot of studies coming out of the UK, actually on, on patients who had severe cases of COVID now experiencing um, a lot of psychological aftermath as, as a consequence of being on ventilators. Um, and uh, for providers having been working in sort of extreme uncertain um, unpredictable conditions. I think um, that that there will also be a, a consequence there as well. Um, and then in regards to the to the general population, I think it's again been an, an uncertain year out of the realm of normal human human experience, and um, and we will likely see consequences from that articulated. And I think it'll be really interesting to see um, not only how human resiliency plays into the aftermath, but also how artists of our time choose to reflect and, and articulate upon um, the past year. So it's been a year since you carried this exhibition. Mm. So now that you know, you know, now that you've had the experience and you've had a year's distance from the curation of this exhibition, Neely, I'm so sorry. You cut out a bit. Okay. No. No. <laughs> I'm going to try that again. Thanks that for good. my patience. This question is related to the first one. Um, it's been a year since you curated this exhibition, right? And you're, you've lived through a pandemic. Um, and the person who asked this question is interested in how you would have, now that you know what you know, how would you have changed this exhibition? Yeah, um, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think what, there were some pieces that I sort of consciously did not include 
in the show because I think it opened another set of questions um, that I was not sort of prepared to explore in, in full with the range of objects that we have. I think the one of the big categories of um, individuals who experience PTSD are those who work in emergency departments and or are first responders. Um, I think there's been a lot of visibility brought to their experience this year. Um, and I think that that the impact of witnessing trauma frequently ha it is non-trivial and, and is something that I would wish I had brought into the show and, and brought into the conversation in the context of the past year. Neely, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks for your patience again. So Kensington, are there any art artists who are not currently in the um, collection here at the Hood whose work you believe would work well with this theme? Yeah. Um, again, you know, a, a great question. I think that there are a lot of voices not represented that I, I wish were. Um, I think the other big topic of this year, you know, in addition to the pandemic has been, um, you bring to the forefront, um, police violence and, and the experience of, um, the African-American community in the United States. And that voice is not present in this show. And, and when we talk about, um, forms of, of daily trauma and especially sort of a, a, a fr cultural framework that might have um, implications for that health and well-being of um, of members of society. I think that that's a big chunk missing here, and and there's a, a lot of artists who could speak to that experience um, that I think would be in the show if if I could sort of have my pick of of any object uh, in the world. This is a question about science. Can you elaborate on the scientific basis of the idea of permanent chemical changes in neurofunction? Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I, I will do my best here. And I, I know I have some neuroscience professors on, so, so hope you hold me accountable. But um, basically the, the body has baseline levels of um, certain chemicals and when things happen, those chemicals fluctuate, which is sort of impacts how we uh, respond to the outside world. What is observed in PTSD, and, and in my research, we observed a lot of the biomarkers of PTSD is the baseline levels of those chemicals are then elevated permanently in a way that you would only anticipate seeing if someone was under extreme stress. Um, so something like cortisol, which is what help support the, the stress response if you're, say, fleeing from a lion, um, is then present all the time. And, and that's what causes those, those behavioral symptoms. And so the, the body is like reacting like there is a stressor present in every moment. Um, and the wear on the body of being in that heightened stress response is, um, is pretty significant as well. So Kensington, how do different gender experiences of trauma, so for example, men in war and women in domestic violence situations affect different experiences of healing and trauma? Yeah, um, I think it's a really interesting question. I think that there are different barriers on both sides. Um, I think that for when we, when we talk about veterans, the, there is a lot of stigma around um, seeking help for psychological um, injury. And I think that is an interesting question about how we um, have created a gender framework that is, asks men particularly not to, um, express emotion or to show emotional weak, weakness or how it would be defined as such. And um, so that creates barriers to seeking treatment. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side, the, 
when we speak about gender-based violence against women, particularly, there are then additional social, economic, sometimes barriers to seeking treatment as well. And, and the way that a woman who raises a, an emotional concern is, is responded to or invalidated can greatly be another barrier to, to that healing process as well. Um, I think both scenarios are, are problematic and, and deeply embedded in the way that we um, have defined and uh, per sort of perpetrated gender roles within our society. Great. This question is, um, you addressed partially at the beginning of your uh, presentation, but maybe you can build on it. So can you talk a little bit about the objects you chose not to include and the process of sifting and narrowing to make your decisions? Yeah, um, another great question. There was a lot of objects in the, sh in the hood collection that documented trauma. Um, there, we have a beautiful series um, beautiful but difficult series um, that is a series of sketches and um, written sort of testimonials of prisoners. Um, there is a series of photographs of women sort of in the moment of, of domestic violence. Um, and so there, there is a lens to trauma that is um, capturing it in the moment. And then there is sort of the reaction to it in the aftermath. And my study, be, because it's predominantly based in the, the long-term consequences of trauma, I wanted to explore objects that spoke to that. Um, I think there's a whole nother conversation to be had about art as uh, bearing witness to major traumatic events. Um, I also wanted to make sure, again, that there was sort of a, a range of voices represented. And so um, there were a lot of objects that supported the other objects in the show, um, but they, that I you know, chose not to include because that one perspective or voice um, had been reflected in part. Um, and then there were honestly aesthetic uh, pieces to the show as well. I think the objects visually um, needed to converse with one another. And so there were objects that I excluded on the basis of, of medium as well. Is grief a part of the post-traumatic stress disorder response? Um, yeah, yes. Um, the, the one of the four major symptoms is a change in mood and affect, which can manifest separately in um, differently in different people. Um, sometimes it, it is more anger, sometimes it is more depression. Um, the that said, the grieving process can be sort of its own thing as well. And, and I think importantly, PTSD is not all encompassing for everything that can happen after a traumatic event or, or after a, a loved one experiences a traumatic event either. And I, it is very common to have several different um, physiological, psychological um, components that someone will experience following, following trauma. Here's another one. Can you comment, Kensington, on the idea that chronic low levels of trauma may cause PTSD? Yeah. Um, to clarify, I the, chronic low levels of trauma probably would not cause PTSD. However, um, low levels of stress do create um, similar chemical changes in the body that are mirrored mirror some of the biological markers of PTSD. So for example, um, those with sort of chronic constant stressors may have elevated cortisol, which is again, um, visible in PTSD. Um, and that has physical, emotional ramifications on someone as well. And so I think the the Bernie Searle, for example, speaks to the idea that even if we're not 
thinking about trauma in the context of a big event or a even a, a big, more popular disorder like PTSD, there may be so- social frameworks that have physiological implications um, in a similar way, but but over a more long term um, timeline as opposed to sort of one big event. All right. So this this question is going to take us back to the artwork. Can you speak more about historical trauma and PTSD being something that can be passed down from generation to generation and how these works might engage with that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think maybe I'll walk back to the, if I can, here, um, the buffalo head. So this is sort of where I, where I introduced this idea. Um, and I, and I think that the walker actually speaks to this as well. Um, but there, I think there are two layers here. One is, you know, for those following, for example, the World War I or World War II generation where the people they were closest to in their lives had experienced and been permanently altered by um, a major event and then, and then hearing about that in detail and, and knowing that people they cared about, that they leaned on and relied on, had experienced these things. I think that there are impacts directly on those um, sort of immediately following a, a generation. And then I think that there are, in the case of the buffalo head, potential long-term consequences to um, major f- events that, that create frameworks or scenarios that put people in a, a position of constantly being thinking about or, or being reminded of a trauma that may have happened several years ago, but, but has ramifications for today. And so when we think about something like um, the displacement of Native Americans in the United States as, as sort of an anchoring example, um, the implications of that still exist. There are still, um, there's still a displaced sentiment that people like Julie Buffalo had articulated in their work that I think indicates that once something happens to a generation of people, it doesn't end necessarily. Um, and, and that's carried throughout, um, throughout history and throughout generations. This speaker, or rather this um, viewer, really loves how you focused on work where language and art intersect. Can you speak to that decision and how language affects trauma and healing? Yeah. Um, I, th- I mean, I think that the, the poetry particularly um, of the Owen and the, and the um, Emily Dickinson are different forms of art that both Leslie Dill and John Walker engaged with and and were impacted by and created work in in parallel to. And so I think visual art is just one medium by which um, one can process traumatic events. I think that um, there there are multiple similar forums for doing so as well. Um, And I think that that for Owen and for for Dickinson, their you know creative process included writing, and I, I wanted to cr- include those elements in the in the show as well because I think um, they speak to the fact that there is no single way to undergo the the recovery process um, that each individual kind of finds their own path um, to to recovery. And we have time just for one more question, and here it is. So Kensington, you mentioned that art and science have a lot to learn from each other. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, Um, I I think for me personally, and again, only speaking to, to my own experience, I was frustrated with the pace of biochemical research that, that I was doing in, in, in full transparency. You know, we were working on a drug that was, 
you know, 50 years in the making and probably another 20 years um, before it could be helpful to patients. Um, and while it was good work and, and I so commend the people who, who are still pushing that, that gauntlet forward, I think that art has been able to do a lot already to help individuals with trauma in a, in a way that science hasn't gotten to yet. And so I think it's very inspiring and very hopeful for those taking the time to dig into the, the biochemistry and, and dig into the pharmaceutical components and, and dig into the pathology of something to see it manifested already working in art. Um, it, it, conversely, I think that um, the artistic process can learn a lot from science as well. And I think that for me, I understood all of these objects through a scientific lens, um, th through knowing, you know, what, what the trauma and recovery process looked like, um, as a pathology. And I think, um, for me, the two have always sort of been, been intertwined and, and hopefully, you know, I know there are art folks on this call. Hopefully they learned a little bit about science and there are science folks on this call. I hopefully they learned a little bit about art. That was a fantastic presentation and the questions were incredible. Thank you all for a really rich conversation this afternoon. And a special thanks to the videographer, Randall Kuhlman, who's behind the camera today, um, without whom none of this magic would happen. Also, I want to encourage you to fill out the short survey that we'll send you tomorrow. It really helps us in our planning for programs and I'm sure Kensington would love to hear some feedback. And please continue to check back on our website regularly for more virtual programs in the future. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. <laughs>